In today's reading of David Hofmeister's Unwind Your Mind Back to God, we continue reading from Book 1, Laying the Foundation, Chapter 2, Section 4. Preliminary Questions on Memory, Creations, and Consciousness. David. The lesson in the course about holding on to your function of forgiveness basically says it entails two phases. Recognizing that forgiveness is your only function and giving up all the other functions that you think you have. The self-concept comes in when there are agendas. When things have to go a certain way with certain outcomes. So what is my priority? Am I going to really hold forgiveness as my only function? Or am I going to let these other agendas come in and take forgiveness off the front and hold those up instead? It has to be either or. Friend, there is an old Indian saying that says, I use memory. I do not let memory use me. That really helps me out a lot in my interpretation. David, I always associated memory with the past until... I read in the text about using memory to remember the present. That is a revolutionary idea. It says that memory is an ability you made. You are used to associating it with the past. But you can actually use it to remember the present. That is where you would have the memory instead of just letting the memory automatically have you. It is an experiential thing. When you let go of the outcomes and just follow the guidance, there is a joyful stepping aside from a lot of these concepts. Time and space are deeply rooted beliefs. Once you start to see these as constructs, then all of a sudden there is a real ease that comes. You start to take to heart the saying that you cannot help but be in the right place at the right time. That is a great one to hold out front when you are traveling a lot. It takes the struggle out of it. It takes out all the, oh gosh, did we make a right turn? What did you do with the map? That whole thing that comes from feeling like you are not in the right place at the right time or you are too early or you are too late. It is a practical kind of an experience. There is a shift of mind like being above things. It is almost like you are on a carpet ride and the only way you stay on the carpet, of course, is to stay divested of the outcomes. If you really hold on to your intention and just want to stay at peace and have holy encounters without knowing how it is going to look, it makes it a lot of fun. The struggle in my life always came from trying to control the outcomes, people or situations. Friend, 
Can you talk about creations? Our creations? David Creation is totally at the level of heaven. You do not know your creations in the sleeping state. But the Father extended himself, created the Son in his likeness and image, and then the Son extended himself and these are the things that are called creations. It is entirely at the level of spirit. In other words, spirit begat spirit begat spirit. It is all a continuous line. In the sleeping state, where perception is distorted, you have no remembrance, no recognition of your creations. It is one of those things that you can really only go so far in talking about. We know they are eternal. We know they are changeless. They are perfect. They are infinite, like the Father and the Christ. Friend, Ken Wapnick talks about how in heaven... God has no consciousness. I felt upset when I heard that. I always thought in terms of the mind being conscious and then I thought, there will be nothing. There was an immediate sense of fear but I heard the small voice say, you know, when you think of what makes you happy, it is always thoughts of love. There was an overwhelming feeling that those thoughts would be more magnified than anything I could even think of. And I was suddenly at peace with it. But I could feel how quickly I shifted out of that, into that ego thinking of, Oh my God, I have picked up a book that says God has no consciousness. I won't have a conscious mind to think. It was a real learning experience. I sense that the thoughts that make me most joyous are those thoughts that I cannot even express. I do not know how else to say it. They are just... David, beyond the words. Friend, yeah. David... I think it does help to be precise about the words. Like what if we asked, what does consciousness mean to everybody in this room? The Course describes consciousness as the receiving mechanism. Of course, messages can be received from the ego or messages can be received from the Holy Spirit. Consciousness is literally the mind that, in this deluded state, is receiving messages from two diametrically opposite voices. Consciousness can be trained to approach the real world at the highest level. Consciousness is aware of the real world. Transpersonal psychology talks about training the mind, about using meditation and mind training to the point of being able to overlook and not hop on the trains anymore. Which means you have reached the real world. Now, that is still a metaphor because there are no levels in the ultimate sense. We talk about a structure of the split mind. But there is not a split mind. It is like a ladder is lowered down into the mind that believes it is split. The ego level is where the teaching is needed. As if there is an individual mind. The ultimate metaphysics are that there is only one mind. 
We talk sometimes about collective egos and the split mind. And this other person's lesson was this and my lesson was that. Basically, the idea of an individual mind is useful because if you believe in bodies, you also believe that there is a separate individual mind that goes with each body. Rather than believing and experiencing the truth of there being only one mind. The split mind sees a subject object split and perceives itself as fragmented. But there is only one mind, and by golly, it is mine. It is always my lesson, regardless of how much the ego wants to throw it out there onto somebody else.